Good morning. I'm glad everybody could be here this morning. It's a little cold and wet outside, but it's uh, another day God gave us, so let's be glad in it. Today we have Amanda Anderson with us. Um, I'm glad she's here with us today. Got a few reminders for the week and for the month. Um, first off, we've got choir practice here today at two in the choir room. Don't forget we have food for body and spirit at six o'clock on Wednesday. We'll be having pizza this week, followed by a viewing of the chosen. We had a little bit of excitement this week. Um, on Thursday, we had a gas leak in one of the heating units in the choir room, and we had a sprinkler head leaking. So we've had to have Duggins and United Sprinkler come out and fix those items, which resulted in us having to reschedule the outreach meeting. Uh, we have decided to have that this coming Tuesday at 6.30, um, I guess we'll meet in here and if we have to move somewhere else, we can. Coming up this month, at the end of the month, they're gonna have the men's breakfast on the last Sunday of the month, along with the women's workshop on the same day. Last week, I neglected to mention that we had birthdays. Uh, John Wade, Johnny Marley, and Sammy Shatterly all had birthdays last week, and I really neglected to mention it, and I apologize, guys, but happy birthday. <laughs> For our Monday Thursday services this year, we are going to do a group service with uh, Bethany. Um, Betty has worked very hard to set this up. Um, they do a little different uh, service than we do. They, it has been described to me as having a meal while the service is going on. Their outreach team is going to provide all of the sandwiches and stuff that will be served, and they have asked that we bring desserts. Betty has put a sign-up sheet in the back if you would like to participate um, please sign up. They've asked us to provide them with a head count. And if you would like to bring a dessert, please indicate that you would like to do so. And my final item is on uh, Saturday, April 1st, we are going to do an Easter egg hunt. It's going to be from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And here's the catch. It's for everyone. Um, it's for all of you. I want to see all of you out there in our field looking for Easter eggs. Bring your grandkids. Bring your kids. Um, any age group is welcome. Um, I just want to see, I really just want to see y'all out there looking for Easter eggs. It'll make my year. Um, I don't have anything else. Uh, if, you, if anybody needs to add anything, feel free to corner me. Uh, let's prepare ourselves for worship.
It is wonderful to be with you all on this cold Sunday in the season of Lent. I was last with you all in mid-January where I would have said, we'll probably see some snowflakes. I uh, didn't know that it would be March and I'd be in, and I'm glad to be back again, but also not knowing it would be in March that we would see a few snowflakes. So uh, thank you all so much for the opportunity to be here with you. As we prepare our hearts to worship God, let us pray. Loving and living God, in this season of Lent, we turn our hearts and our minds towards the cross, towards your love for each of us. You have told us that when two or more are gathered, you are present with us. So in this time of worship, as we sing, as we pray, as we listen to your word and ponder what it means in our lives, may your spirit open, open up our eyes, open up our hearts and our minds to what you would have us know and to where you would lead us. In your name we pray, amen. I invite you to join me in the words of our call to worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before God's presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to the Lord with psalms. The sea is yours, for you made it, and your hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Come, let us worship the Lord. Our hymn is number 21. Our Old Testament scripture reading for this morning is from the book of Psalms. I'll be reading the words of Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God 
and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah and as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore, they shall not enter my rest. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us join in our hymn, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Let us pray together. Lord of life, almighty God, we are gathered here to praise and worship you. We humbly bow down in your presence. You are our God, great in love and forgiveness. You give us grace and mercy every day just because you love us. You gave your son to show us your love and to wash away the sin that separates us from you. We learned how to love from you, and because of this sacrifice, to love others. Help us to follow Christ and to love the Lord our God with all our mind, heart, soul, and strength. Help us to follow Christ and love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to follow Christ to receive the grace that is given and be transformed to show love and obedience in ways that will glorify God as Jesus did on the cross. Come and live in us as we travel with you in our Lenten journey to the cross. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up those here at Shiloh and with connections to Shiloh on our prayer list for all the ill and infirmed in our hearts and minds. We call their names so everyone will pray for them, and we know you hear every prayer. We pray for Johnny in his upcoming surgery. Guide the hands of the surgeons and all who would care for him for a swift and complete recovery. We continue to pray for Elsie, 
Debbie, Kiera, Anna Rose, Sammy and Ellen, Bain and Ethel, Jennifer, and all those in our hearts that need your care. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for all those who suffer from hunger, war, and violence, for those who have lost loved ones in death and those who have survived great disaster and tragedy. Be with them and give them hope and strength to survive and follow you. Help us as we send supplies and food to those in need, and we pray that they be multiplied to meet the need. We pray for peace to be worked out between warring parties and the conflict halted. We pray for a return to respect and cooperation in that process and that weapons be put aside for reconciliation. Be present in their talks, Lord, and fill the place with your forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. <coughs> we continue to pray for our children in school and their safety. We continue to pray for our church, our session, and those preparing us for a new pastor. We pray for each other and for our loved ones and our families, our friends. We pray for our communities and for the ongoing of your kingdom through spreading the good news to all people. Help us learn new things in our Lenten journey with you to the cross and renew our commitment with new joy and awareness. We ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now join me in the reading of our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, life everlasting. Amen. As we prepare to listen to God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light and in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord we pray, amen. Our New Testament scripture reading for this morning comes to us from John's Gospel, and at this point in John's story of the Gospel story of Jesus, Jesus is going about doing work out in, the, in his ministry, and he finds himself journeying through Samaria. Now, the power of that word and place is a little lost on us today. Who are these Samaritans? Now, of course, there's Jesus' parable of the good Samaritan. So we might hear that word Samaria and say, well, why is it a big deal that Jesus is passing through their region? So let me start with a bit of an analogy, and it's good for this time of March Madness in North Carolina. I want you to imagine that you are the biggest Duke basketball fan. Now, I don't know, some of you, that may be real painful, that may be painful to imagine, but just, just for the sake of this sermon, let's imagine you're the biggest Duke basketball fan, and you're dressed up in all of your Duke gear, and you're at a game, and you realize to get to your seat at the game, you are going to have to walk through the student section of the UNC students in the Dean Dome on the night of the Duke-UNC game. That wouldn't be a very easy walk through, would it? You might want to walk every way you can to avoid getting to your seat by a different way. 
That is what walking through Samaria would have meant for Jewish people in Jesus' day. You see, Jews and Samaritans did not mix together. They did not eat together. Big separation between the two groups. And they had spent years arguing over where to worship God, which is some of the basis of that separation. We'll hear that directly mentioned in our reading from John's Gospel. The Jews want to worship in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans say in Mount Gerizim. And that goes, that's an argument that goes back, what is it, as old as the hills, goes back several hundred years. So when Jesus comes to a well in the Samaritan country and engages in conversation with a woman who's at this well. He is doing a scandalous and I'd say even a dangerous thing. Now the other thing before I get to our reading is I want you to note in your mind uh, when it says the time of day that this event occurs. So let us listen to John chapter 4 verses 5 through 42. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will come in them, become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. 
So the disciples said to one another, surely no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say, four months more, then comes the harvest, but I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor, and others have labored, and you have, in, you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have done, ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word, They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, any time a minister comes to preach on this fascinating um, amazing text from John 4, one has to start with a bit of what we call a church nerd joke. Now, I realize I've set it up that it's a joke, so so roll with me. So someone goes in to get a cake for their parents' 50th wedding anniversary and wants to put scripture on that cake, and they tell the baker, look up the letter of 1 John 4, 18, which reads... There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. But the baker, who obviously didn't go to Sunday school enough, goes and looks up the gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 18, and writes these words on the anniversary cake. John 4, 18 says, For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. It pays to go to Sunday school, folks. It does. So what are we to make of the famous, perhaps in some circles, infamous Samaritan woman at the well? Like the first people who would have heard this story, who would have heard this scene, her outward situation, no one in her time or place would have given her any respect or any attention at all. First, she is a woman in an era where where all women had pretty low social status. Second, she is a Samaritan, and as I said, Samaritans were not viewed very kindly by the larger Jewish population. And then third, there is this whole question about her marital status. One might even say her marital history. Five husbands, Jesus says to her. And he knows about this. Jesus knows about this, and he still takes the time to talk to her? Yeah. Yeah, he does. Jesus does. Now, it should be noted when we read this passage that Jesus does not appear to pass any sort of judgment upon her. She may even have been the victim of a a marriage system in place at the time where each brother in her first husband's family would have been obligated to marry her, and perhaps the last brother refused. We don't know those details. John doesn't give them to us. But we do have one big detail to follow. Jesus specifically tells us the woman went to the well to draw water, a daily task. She went at noon, or the sixth hour, depending on what translation you read. If we were living in the first century, we might say something like, who in their right minds goes to draw their water at noon? It's the hottest, hottest part of the day. It would be like if I told you, uh, I like to go grocery shopping at 5 a.m. on Saturdays. I am not awake at 5 a.m. on Saturdays. For the Samaritan woman, everybody in the whole town would know you go to get your water 
early in the morning or late in the evening when it is cool. I mean, that's just crazy, going to get your water at noon. It's almost like she doesn't want to bump into anybody. She doesn't want to see anybody. She doesn't want to be seen by anybody. She doesn't want to talk to anybody, and she doesn't want to be talked about by anybody. The woman went to the well at noon because she was a social outcast. A few years ago, I heard a journalist, Nureth Eisenman, talk, about a, a talk on a show, the NPR show, All Things Considered, and some of the things that were told in this story just stopped me in my tracks because I said, one day, the next time I ever preach on the Samaritan woman at the well, I gotta mention some of the things in this article, this piece on the radio. Now, it is the story from another part of our world. It is a current story where fathers still make arrangements for the marriages of their daughters. And in this story, in this certain situation, it became obvious that the father needed to break the arrangement that he had made for his daughter. But what struck me most in this story was what happened as the father talked about what will likely be their family's situation when he breaks off this arrangement. He said he and his family will be completely ostracized for life. Eisenman speaks about that the father said, my brothers would stop talking to me. If I were to go into a shop, nobody would sell me anything. If my wife, this is, I, I didn't make this up. If my wife were to go to the well, no one would help her carry the water. It would be like being dead while you're still alive. I think the Samaritan woman at the well is enduring this sort of reality day in and day out. Yet, she is not beyond the reach of the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus and the woman talk about water, not always understanding the other, but about this living water, about the treasure of eternal life and of living a life changed by the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. It is truly a treasure. It is like drinking a miraculous kind of water that will never leave you thirsty again. And you also can't talk about this story without mentioning one other detail, the water jar. The water jar that the woman has brought to the well, that she brings every day to the well, John gives us another wonderful detail in this gospel story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. When she realizes who Jesus truly is, she runs to tell everybody in town. And what does John say? She leaves her jar of water behind what a powerful image of transformation and of grace. Jesus reaches out to her with living water and she can leave the worries of this life and her life. She can leave them behind her. The temporary quenching of, quenching of thirst with water is nothing compared to the living water. You don't even need to bring your own water jug. Your own water bottle. We're always walking around with our water bottles these days. <laughs> you don't even need to bring your own water bottle. The living water fills you up, changes you. You are invited to dive into the living waters in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, we all are the woman at the well in moments in our lives. We are all on a journey to find that transformation in Christ, that new life that Christ brings to each of us. And our journeys can bring us back to the well again and again. In those trying times, Jesus reaches out to us and reminds us of his grace and mercy. And sometimes we look at Jesus and say, how can Jesus love me knowing everything 
about me. A popular contemporary Christian song a few years ago asked the question, who am I? Who am I to be loved by you, Jesus? But Jesus is there, offering to fill our water jars with an overflowing water that quenches our thirst. A number of years ago, the authors Tom Rath and Donald Clifton read a book that asked the question, how full is your bucket? Some of you might have read it. I found a children's version that my children have enjoyed reading over the years. So their idea is that each of us, through our day, carries around an invisible bucket where our feelings are most keenly understood and somewhat retained now, when our buckets are empty, we feel emotionally devoid, we feel sad, we feel bad about ourselves. But when our bucket is full, we are happy, we are overflowing with joy. So how does our bucket become filled or how does our bucket become emptied? Each day of our lives, we have experiences that can tip our buckets of water. You get yelled at or talked down to at work. You overhear something someone said about you. Someone lets you down. These all cause the water levels in our buckets to go down. And on some days, it feels like our buckets are completely dry. Let me just say, in the image in the children's books, our buckets are above our heads. I find myself wanting to do this, and I'm sure you all wonder, why is she doing that? Because our invisible buckets are up here. Now, on the other side, when someone gives you a compliment, drops of water begin to accumulate in your bucket. You get a phone call or an email from a friend. You complete a tough task at school or at work. Someone helps you out, and the puddle in your bucket begins to grow. And on days when we feel the most supported and the most loved by other people, our buckets fill to overflowing. And the most important thing for us to remember is that each and every day, every single day, we have a chance to fill the buckets of those around us. And we also have the chance to empty the buckets of those around us. And this includes the buckets of those who are closest to us, but also the strangers we might meet in the gas station or in the grocery store. Well, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, had her water jar, dare I say, her bucket, filled to overflowing that day. She was an outcast. She was a woman with no name, and she lugged that heavy, pesky water jar all alone at noon to the well in Samaria. And on that day, she was transformed by the power and the outreach and the love of Jesus Christ. She was empowered for ministry. Ministry and her town and her people, they would never be the same. May the Holy Spirit grant us the gift to fill each other's buckets. May the Holy Spirit grant us the ability to show people the living water that can fill buckets overflowing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, amen. Friends, I'd like us to take a few moments, um, I guess I get to say a moment of privilege in worship. Um, as, is, as has been mentioned earlier, um, our brother Johnny Marley will be anticipating surgery tomorrow. And while Presbyterians may, you know, we may have earned that moniker, the frozen chosen, but within our worship and within our lives together, it is, um, it is allowed and it is recommended that we might at times uh, join together in prayer with the laying on of hands. So I want us to take a few moments this morning and invite, if you are able to come forward for an actual laying on of hands of Johnny as I pray for him, um, I invite you to do so. If you're not able to do that, I invite you simply to hold out your hands um, so that we might pray for Johnny and show that love and support that we might fill Johnny's bucket uh, as he anticipates this tomorrow. So Johnny, come on down front. And those of you who are, who are able to come down front for laying on of hands, please do.
You can, if you can, or you can connect to somebody who's connected to somebody. There we go. There we go. All right, let us, let us go to God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you to lift up Johnny to you. Please help to keep his anxieties to a minimum. Please remind him that you are with him, that you are his child, that you love him. Lord, I know there will be so many prayers said for him tomorrow and during his time of surgery. We know that you will hear those prayers. Lord, I ask that you might do your work through the care team, through the surgeons, through all those who will be helping Johnny at this time. Lord, I thank you for this community, this fellowship of Shiloh Presbyterian Church, for the ways that they care for one another, for the ways that they show your love to one another. Lord, I lift up Johnny to you, and I give you thanks for the gift of this place. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.
Please join me for the prayer of confession. O Lord, our God, you call us to proclaim the gospel, but we remain silent in the presence of evil. You call us to be reconciled to you and one another, but we are content to live in separation. You call us to seek the good of all, but we fail to resist the powers of oppression. You call us to fight pretensions and injustice, but we sit idly by, endangering the lives of people far and near. Forgive us, O Lord. Reconcile us to you by the power of your Spirit, and give us the courage and strength to be reconciled to others through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Now the assurance of pardon. Listen, so that you may have life. The steadfast love of the Lord never fails. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
The woman at the well said, you know everything about me. And Jesus said, and I love you still. Friends, that is our message as we journey toward the cross in this season of Lent. As you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace, both this day and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.